So now let's start with the hemolytic anemias. So hemolytic anemias can be divided into two types based on the uh, defect. Okay. So either it could be a defect in the RBC itself like an intracorpuscular defect or something else which is going to attack the RBCs and cause their lysis. So that is an extracorpuscular death. So under intracorpuscular death, what are the things which can be uh, problematic in the um, uh, RBC. So, either it could be an inherited kind of a defect or an acquired kind of a defect. So, under acquired defects, the only example is going to be a paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. But under inherited disorders, either the RBC membrane could be defective or the RB enzymes which are uh, present in the RBCs could be defective or it could be the hemoglobin which is present in the RBC could be defective. So, the various examples for each we will be discussing in detail. Then under extracorpuscular defect, the RBCs can either be killed by a immune mediated mechanism like in an autoimmune hemolytic anemia or a RH, uh, RH or an ABO incompatibility uh, reaction, okay, transmission reaction kind of thing. Or if there it could be a non-immune kind of an extracorpuscular defect like in a mechanical kind of damage to the RBC. It could be either a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or even March hemoglobinuria. So, uh, other examples could be snake venom, clostridial infections as well. So, this March hemoglobinuria, it is uh, given this name March hemoglobinuria because it is common in soldiers. They do this March pass, right? So, because of continuous uh, physical trauma to the uh, legs, the RBCs are going to be damaged in them. So, it is going to cause a hemolysis in the RBCs that is why it is it is actually a physical mechanical trauma to the RBC. So, that is March hemoglobinuria example of non-immune type of extracorpuscular defect. So, each of the diseases under these categories we will be discussing in detail. Again, the hemolysis can further be divided into an intravascular or an extravascular hemolysis. So, based on whether the RBC lysis is taking place inside the vessel or in the spleen, we are going to classify it. So, intravascular as the name suggests, it, the hemolysis is going to take place inside the blood vessel while for an extravascular hemolysis, the lysis is going to take place in the spleen, okay, somewhere in uh, outside the vessel. So, both um, uh, both intravascular and extravascular hemolysis is going to result in anemia and jaundice because there is hemolysis. So, RBCs are lost resulting in anemia. So, whenever there is RBC lysis, hemoglobin is going to be released, right? So, the released hemoglobin is further broken down into bilirubin which is the end product. So, bilirubin whenever it is increased, it is going to result in jaundice. So, anemia and jaundice is common features for both while in intravascular hemolysis since the RBCs are bro broken down in the vessels only, the hemoglobin which is released from the RBCs are going to be increased in the blood. So, there is going to be hemoglobinemia and as such this hemoglobin gets converted into methemoglobin also. So, there will be methemoglobinemia and then this hemoglobin is going to be excreted in urine. So, it is going to cause hemoglobinuria and then there is a protein in the a circulation called as serum haptoglobulin. So, this haptoglobulin is uh, its function is to take up this um, free hemoglobin. So, whatever free hemoglobin is uh, just like that lying in the circulation, it will take up this. Okay. So, as and when this hemoglobin is going to be increased in intravascular hemolysis, the serum haptoglobulin is going to take up this. So, the levels of serum haptoglobulin are being consumed. So, the serum haptoglobulin levels are going to go down. So, these th four features which is hemoglobinemia, methemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, and then decrease the serum haptoglobin levels are kind of specific for intravascular hemolysis. The example of intravascular hemolysis will be microangiopathic hemolytic anemias. So, the examples of microangiopathic hemolytic anemias will be hemolytic uremic syndrome, thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura, DIC, disseminated intravascular coagulation. So, all these three, uh, there is going to be a damage of the RBCs in the vessels. Then in extravascular hemolysis, if you see, there is going to be some defect in the RBCs because of which the uh, or it could be because of autoantibodies against this RBCs. So, all of this is going to cause a uh, death of the RBCs in the spleen. So, the RBCs when they are passing through the spleen, they could not be traversing through the sinusoids of the spleen. So, that thing or because of the autoantibodies, the RBCs are going to be lysed in the spleen. So, because of that, it is going to be called as extravascular hemolysis and because it uh, the spleen is the organ in which the RBCs are being lysed, there is going to be organomegaly. So, hepatosplenomegaly will be seen in these patients. Okay.
So, the examples of extravascular hemolysis, the most of the hemolytic anemias are going to fall under this extravascular hemolytic category. So, sickle cell anemia, thalassemias or hereditary spherocytosis, all of this are going to be examples of extravascular hemolysis. So, let us start with hereditary spherocytosis. So, hereditary spherocytosis is actually a intracorpuscular defect in the membrane of the RBCs and it is an inherited disorder. So, it is going to be inherited under the autosomal dominant inheritance. So, every generation is going to be affected. So, this diagram we already saw it, the RBC membrane structure, right? So, this is the alpha and beta spectrum along with we are going to have multiple proteins which are arranged. So, in this hereditary spherocytosis, it is going to be the anchorin protein which is going to be mutated. So, the most common mutation in uh, hereditary spherocytosis is going to be anchorin mutation. The second most common is going to be the band 3 mutation, okay? So, most common mutation in hereditary spherocytosis is going to be anchorin more than band 3. So, the most abundant protein on RBC membrane we already saw it is CD71 or glycophorin A. The most common mutation in hereditary elliptocytosis. So, as the name suggests here, hereditary spherocytosis means the RBCs rather than being uh, biconcave, they are going to uh, acquire a shape like a sphere, like a ball. Okay. So, that is spherocytosis. While uh, hereditary elliptocytosis is another inherited condition in which the RBCs are becoming ellipto elliptocytes. Okay. So, they are becoming elliptoid. So, the most common mutation in hereditary elliptocytosis is going to be alpha spectrum. Okay. So, this one is going to be mutated in hereditary elliptocytosis. So, what happens when anchorin mutation is present? So, anchorin mutation, it was an autosomal dominant mutation, right? So, anchorin mutation is going to cause the, the RBC membrane is going to be altered here. So, it is making it less deformable. The RBC membranes usually have to be very much uh, deformable so that they can squeeze through the splenic sinusoids when they are passing through the spleen. So, that is normalcy. But when there is a mutation in one of the membrane potents, what happens is the RBCs, they become less deformable. So, they are not able to pass through the splenic sinusoids, they will they be forming spherocytes. So, the RBCs are going to be, the membrane is going to be defective and they form spherocytes, especially microspherocytes. So, microspherocytes meaning rather than being goboiconcave, the RBCs are going to become smaller in size and then their central pallor is not going to be there. In, instead, the entire thing of the RBC is going to appear pink in color. Okay, so this is micro spherocytes. So, any difference in the shape of the RBCs, it cannot pass through the splenic sinusoids, it cannot de deform. So, it is going to result in extravascular hemolysis in the spleen. Okay, extravascular hemolysis in the spleen. Right? So, as such, the clinical features of hereditary spherocytosis is a triad of anemia, splenomegaly and jaundice. So, anemia and jaundice was common for any hemolytic anemia, right? Apart from that, there is going to be splenomegaly because it is an extravascular hemolysis. As such, it is not specific for HS. It is just that uh, it is seen in HS as well. It is also seen in uh, the same triad is seen in sickle cell anemia also. And there is... Uh, bilirubinemia, right? So, there, whenever there is the unconjugated bilirubinemia excess, it is going to form pigment stones, okay? Then the findings in hereditary spherocytosis, if you see, being an autosomal dominant disorder, you will have to elicit for a family history. So, every generation is going to be affected here. And then if you see the CBC picture, the MCV is going to be decreased because spherocytes are smaller. They are microspherocytes, right? So, MCV is going to go down while the MCH is going to be normal because the hemoglobin production is not going to be affected. So, MCH is going to be normal while MCV is uh, decreased while MCHC is going to be elevated because well, the uh, hemoglobin concentration is the same here but the, I'm sorry the hemoglobin level is going to be the same here but the volume is decreased. So, in the smaller volume this entire hemoglobin has to accumulate. So, in the main, uh, in the sense the MCHC is going to be elevated. MCHC was normal in megaloblastic anemia, MCHC is elevated in HS, right? So, this is the image of the peripheral smear in this, if you see, all of this RBCs, all of this RBCs, they are having, they don't have a pallor, right? They are just having this pinkish uh, thing. So, uniform pinkish material is there. So, all of this are the micro spherocytes, right? So, this thing about hereditary spherocytosis, this microspherocytes are going to be uniform in size and shape. So, spherocytes are not specific for HS alone. Spherocytes can be seen in other conditions like G6PD deficiency and autoimmune hemolytic anemia. In fact, the most common cause of spherocytosis is, spherocytes is going to be 
IHA, autoimmune hereditary, uh, sorry, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, okay. We also see these spherocytes in G6 free deficiency, then uh, uh, snake venom kind of thing, clostridial infections or even in this uh, hereditary spherocytosis. So, here this microspherocytes actually are uniform in size and shape in hereditary spherocytosis while it is having an altered shape, different size and shape in the autoimmune hemolytic anemia, right. So, in peripheral smear we just see this presence of this uniform microspherocytes. So, osmotic fragility. So, osmotic fragility is a test to test the uh, fragility of the RBCs in a hypotonic saline. So, osmotic fragility in HS is going to be elevated, okay. So, this is kind of a diagnostic test for HS. So, normally if you put an RBC in a hypotonic saline, it is obviously going to rupture because it is a hypotonic saline because of osmosis, water is uh, going to enter into the RBCs and RBCs will rupture. But the concentration at which the RBCs in normal RBCs are going to rupture is going to be at 0.5 percentage of the hypotonic saline. At 0.5 percentage hypotonic saline, the RBCs, normal RBCs will rupture. While in HS, it is going to uh, uh, die, it is going to rupture at a uh, higher concentration itself. That is, at 0.7 percentage itself. So, normal saline is going to be 0.9 percentage, right? So, at 0.7 percentage itself, the RBC starts rupturing at a uh, in hereditary spherocytosis, while in normal it is 0.5 only. So, if you plot this osmotic fragility against the percentage of this uh, hypotonic saline, the uh, it is going to yield a graph. So, the hereditary spherocytosis graph is going to have a shift of curve to the right side. So, right shift of curve, this image can be given and they can ask it. So, this green one is the normal curve wherein the so, wherein the uh, uh, hemolysis had started at 0.5 only. But if you see in hereditary spherocytosis, it has started at 0.7, 0 0.8 itself. Okay. So, this is why there is increased uh, osmotic fragility in hereditary spherocytosis. Then coming to the treatment of hereditary spherocytosis, so the problem here was actually the extravascular hemolysis taking place in the spleen, right? So, if I am going to re remove the spleen, so I do a splenectomy, so the hemolysis cannot happen in the periphery. But still, if you see the peripheral smear, the spherocytes will be persisting because there is the membrane defect of the RBCs is still there, but it is not the membrane is uh, because of the membrane defect, the RBCs are not lysed in the spleen because they had undergone splenectomy. So, spherocytes will persist even after splenectomy. So, if you are doing splenectomy for any reason, so you will have to give prophylactive vaccines against pneumococcus and influenza. So, usually pneumococcus and influenza viruses, these are going to be so, pneumococcus and influenza, if you see, they are going to be normally opsonized and then killed, killed in the spleen. So, if you are going to remove the spleen, there is going to be increased risk of infection of this pneumococcus and influenza. So, whenever you are doing a splenectomy, you will have to give prophylactic uh, uh, vaccines against these two infections, right? So, the next is uh, we have seen about hereditary spherocytosis. Next is hereditary elliptocytosis. As the name suggests, there is going to be formation of elliptocytes in the peripheral smear. And here the mutation is going to be alpha alpha spectrum mutation. Hereditary stomatocytosis. The, uh, there is going to be formation of stomatocytes. So, stomato uh, means it is mouth like. Okay. So, in the RBC, if you see. So, the pallor is going to have just a slit like kind of a pallor rather than a central one third pallor. Here, there is going to be a slit like pallor which is looking like a mouth. Okay. So, this is the characteristic appearance in a hereditary stomatocytosis. Then we have acanthocytes. So, these are again membrane defects. Okay. So, acanthocytes and echinocytes. Acanthocytes are nothing but spur cells. Spur cells meaning these are go, uh, on the sur membrane of the RBCs, there is going to be irregular spikes of irregular at irregular uh, gap. Okay. So, between the in, in uh, there is going to be random small and large irregular spikes occurring at random distance. Okay. So, this is irregular spikes at irregular uh, distance. So, this is going to be called as acanthocytes or spur cells and these are seen in A beta lipoproteinemia. Okay. A for A. Then we have echinocytes. Echinocytes are going to be called as burr cells and these are going to have regular spikes at regular intervals. So, regular spikes are going to be there, small regular spikes at regular intervals. So, examples of this is going to be burns and uremia. 
okay bird cells b burns b okay burns and uremia also both acanthocytes and echinocytes can be seen in any kind of liver disease or disorder sort of okay in liver disease also you can see this acanthocytes and echinocytes so this is the image of acanthocytes and echinocytes so in this you see the rbc's is having random kind of spikes smaller and large spikes at irregular intervals echinocytes here if you see smaller regularly spaced regular spikes are seen okay